Is my voice coming through? My voice coming through okay? Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> good morning or good afternoon, everybody, from whatever part of the country that you're uh, calling in from. And welcome to our segment here on the five basic things you need to know about a successful hardwood flooring installation. Um, thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to switch to the next slide. So if you just click on the middle of the screen. There we there go. go. I, I did that. It didn't work. So now here we go. So as I was introduced as a uh, Drew Kern, I am certified in what I do. Uh, but primarily what I do, and the reason I'm here talking to you about this, is I look at failed floors. I look at complaints. It's like the doctor only seeing sick people. Um, and you think you know it all until you see your next floor and you learn something else. So with that being said, there are many, many factors that are required for a successful hardwood installation. The list goes on and on. You can't really drop the ball at any one particular item. But we don't have all day or all week to talk about this. So what I've done here is I've compressed it into the five basics or the five most important successful items that you need for a hardwood installation. I've selected these because these are the most overlooked items that installers go in and drop the ball on and cause failures or complaints. So in the next half hour, we're gonna cover the uh, site conditions, a little bit on moisture, uh, subfloor, I think that's probably the biggest one. Um, it's important to follow manufacturer's instructions and then a little bit about uh, what happens after the floor is installed. So let's get started here. Proper site conditions. Um, the book says that we have to ensure that every site is ready for hardwood and that the HVAC system has to be up and running for a minimum of seven days. Well, that's what the book says, but it's correct. But we live in the real world and I do understand with new building construction, it's, it's almost impossible to go by the book. But it is important, and this is your take home, this is your takeaway from this slide, that the site be at normal expected living conditions. I'll give you an example. If you're wearing your coat as an installer on a site installing a floor, I'm gonna to suggest to you it's probably not at normal living condition. So we have to have some form of stability in the air. We have to have some form of system that can maintain the temperature and relative humidity levels. Uh, and where I'm going with this is I see too many installs where the windows or doors are not even installed yet. That is a recipe for success. We're not looking for per perfection because we're not gonna find that in a lot of the areas that we install, but let's minimize our problems after the fact. With the site conditions, all the wet trades should be done before installation. That doesn't mean that you can't paint a room or tile a floor afterwards, but when you got this collective um, group of wet trades from drywallers, painters, tilers, and all the other wet trades that go into the house, including new home construction that will have a lot of moisture still coming out of the lumber or the concrete that was poured in the basement, these all add up. Um, we need the exterior graded away from the house. That includes the rain management system to be in place gutters, downspouts, graded away. If your house is on a crawl space, uh, we have few areas of Canada where we're still on crawl spaces because of the ground below. Um, it has to be properly prepared. So these site conditions are all necessary for a successful installation. And if you show up and you, you, you're an installer, you're driving up to the house and you see that there, it's not graded away, it's not necessarily a big panic, but if it's really big, like a big puddle next to the house, perhaps that's a red flag for you to say, maybe I should come back at another time. I love this slide because if it doesn't start right, it won't finish right. And it's not the finishing of the hardwood that matters, it's how it starts. And we can't go back and, uh, and correct that. If we install a floor and a subfloor that's inappropriate, it's too late. So let's start these jobs right. Talking a little bit about acclimation and moisture basics. These are just a couple basic definitions before we get started. When I talk about moisture content, I'll be referring to the amount of water that is in the wood. It's, it's, it's uh, expressed in a percentage. When I talk about relative humidity, I'm talking about the amount of moisture that's in the air. So 
So we're not going to turn around and say the, uh, the relative humidity of the, of the hardwood. I hear that all the time, and it's an incorrect statement. We want to say the moisture content of the hardwood. The relative humidity is in the air. And it's even incorrect to say humidity. We have to say relative humidity because if I say it's 35%, that means nothing to me unless you tell me a temperature. Is it 35% at minus 10 or is it 35% at plus 30? And I can use Celsius up here in Canada that I can't when I'm teaching down in the States. So relative humidity is relative to a particular temperature. Why is this important? Well, this is important because the products that we're using, wood floors, whether they're solid or engineered, are hygroscopic by nature. Hygroscopic means that it's a product that will take on or gain moisture from the ambient conditions. When it, ga when it gains moisture, it'll expand. We call that dimensional change. When it loses moisture, it'll change dimension by shrinking. So we're gonna talk about this a little bit later on, but this is why moisture is important. So I often ask a class, what is acclimation? And the majority of the people will reply, well, acclimation is delivering the wood or the product to the job site ahead of time. Well, that is one way of doing it, but it's not what acclimation means, and it's not the only way. So acclimation is actually allowing the wood to adjust to normal living conditions at the site. Can this be done off-site? Yes, it can. So we can actually acclimate the wood in a warehouse. If I have a climate controlled warehouse that is at normal living conditions or something that's comfortable for my body, that wood is being acclimated to be installed at the site. Now, having said that, let's put the shoe on the other foot. Can I deacclimate wood or adjust it wrong by delivering it ahead of time? Yes. So if I deliver wood to a new home construction that is not at normal living conditions, it's gonna sit there on site and absorb all that moisture from the ambient conditions. When it te technically was properly acclimated prior to being delivered, but it got deacclimated or out of adjustment by sitting on the site. So by delivering ahead of time is not necessarily acclimating a floor. Believe it or not, wood flooring has a comfort level. And this comfort level is in the industry, we know it as 30% to 50% relative humidity. And that's at the normal temperatures that we're accustomed to between 15 and 26 degrees indoors. And the reason we have this, this comfort level of 30 to 50% relative humidity at 15 to 26 degrees is allows the wood to become equalized at 6% to 9% moisture content. So let me bring your attention to a chart. This chart is put out by the US Department of Agriculture and it's uh, backed up by Virginia Tech. So if you look along the bottom of this chart and we go between 30 and 50% relative humidity up to the temperatures that we like to have in a house, our wood products, this includes your kitchen cabinets, your drywall, your trim, your crown molding, all the other items in your house. We go between 6.1 and 9.4% relative humidity. Now, this 30 to 50% is not a steadfast rule, it's a guide. The key here is a 20% range. So what I like to use, I like to use examples down in the States because they're a little bit more extreme than what we have up here in Canada. If we go to Arizona, are we gonna be able to keep our indoor relative humidity between 30 and 50? No, Arizona's very dry. They're more between 10 and 20%, 10 to 30%. So they're installing wood in Arizona around three to 4% moisture content. Now, if I get on a plane and fly to Florida, they're very wet all year round, but those installers down there are putting in wood at 13% because that's the normal living conditions, that's the equilibrium of that area because they maintain anywhere between 60 and 80% relative humidity. Now, what causes our issues up here in Canada in most places except for the Vancouver area. So if we take it places like, uh, I don't know, Edmonton, Manitoba, Calgary, Montreal, our winters are closer to 20% relative humidity inside and closer to 60, 65% relative humidity in the summer. 
So we have these extremes from winter to summer that we have to kind of maintain or balance. But if an installer goes in and doesn't use, doesn't make sure that the place is kind of in the middle there in a normal range and that the wood is properly acclimated, you're heading for some sort of a failure. We can talk about those a little bit later. How do we determine if we're acclimated or not? Well, we can determine by doing moisture testing. Now, moisture testing is a really, really big topic that's going to take a day or possibly a couple days to go through. So the only thing I'm going to say about moisture testing is that it can be done to determine if you have a green flag to go ahead with your installation or a red flag to stop an installation. Most installers use an electrical impedance meter to see if they're within range. If you're on concrete or working with concrete floors, there's ways of measuring moisture in there. One that we see written in the instructions quite a bit are calcium chloride tests. I gotta be honest with you, I'm not a real big fan of these tests. I wish they'd get written out of the, um, the industry, out of instructions, but unfortunately they're still there. I believe more in the in situ testing, which is RH testing in concrete. You drill a hole and you measure the RH, the relative humidity in the little airspace that's created in the concrete. With that type of testing, you can go back and get re-readings and see it at different times of the year, different, uh, different seasons. There's other types of moisture testing that you can use, but I'm gonna save that for another day if Chris wants to put on a, another class about moisture testing. But it has to be done because you can't walk into a, a room or you can't pick up a piece of board, I can't do it, and tell you what moisture it is without having performed a test to see if it's ready for installation. Moving on to subfloor preparation. This is the biggie, and this is what a lot of manufacturers um, think are the biggest setbacks in a lot of their claims, um, and I would agree with them. And it is the installer's responsibility to recognize this. So it might not be the installer's responsibility to correct these matters. It is their responsibility to inspect the subfloor, make sure it's suitable for the installation of that product that they are putting down, and if they start installing, they've accepted the subfloor. Key points to anybody who does installations or manages installations. We have many different kinds of subfloors out there. Our panel products, the OSBs and plywoods, the old houses have solid boards. We're doing more and more on concrete floors. And in some areas of Canada and the United States, uh, concrete is what they're installing on all the time. But it goes a little bit further. What type of slab, what type of thickness on a wood subfloor, what type of joist sides, uh, spans, uh, spacing of these joists. And even though they meet building code, well, they might meet building code or they might be okay to float a floor upon or put carpet across, but they might not meet the criteria for a successful hardwood installation. We're doing more and more in-floor radiant heat today. So the subfloor and the product has to be compatible for that radiant heat. And when we're doing our glue down installations, we have to look for contaminants or something that doesn't cause a bond breaker or something to fail the adhesive on the installation. So a basic checklist for an installer is to check for moisture, rot, deflection, movement, anything in the floor, make sure it's secure. Uh, any squeaks, those will come through even after the uh, hardwood floors are put in. Uh, level and flat, we're gonna talk about that again later, but they're two different things. We're looking for floor flatness. Sometimes in your contract, it might be level. Cracks and gaps, I've, I've seen so many times installers install over big holes in the subfloor. Um, I saw it last week, totally inappropriate. And there's only one person responsible for that. Uh, also on our checklist is pH levels for the concrete and contaminants whenever you're doing a glue down. The, uh, the adhesives react to uh, certain pH levels and they have to be in, uh, in check as well. Subfloors have tolerances, industry standards, as well as most manufacturers' in installation instructions. A uh, common flatness in our industry is 3 16 over 10 feet or 1 8 over 6 feet. I'm going to suggest to you there's not too many subfloors that are actually that flat. So most of them do need work. And if it has valleys or, or peaks that exceed these tolerances, we need to grind them down or fill them. The installer doesn't have to do the work. He has to recognize it. But if you're a good installer, this is more work for you and another thing you can invoice for. 
We can grind off these areas. We can fill them with patch. We can taper off the height differences if, the, if a subfloor decides to drop towards a corner of a room. We have to secure these loose areas down. We have to clean off any debris and contaminants. If there's subfloors that have to be removed and replaced, if it's an incompatible subfloor, we do not nail down over particle board. Uh, so if it's a particle board subfloor, that has to be replaced. Instead, uh, we can shim from below. And all these subfloors have to meet the manufacturer specs because when there's a failure, the first thing that's gonna happen is that subfloor doesn't meet spec and then it's the installer's responsibility. So what we don't do on our subfloors, and I've seen all these happen out there in the industry, uh, installers are shimming the, uh, the hardwood with cardboard underneath. That's a temporary fix. There is no instruction, no repair method not taught anywhere in the industry, except by the wrong mentor to the wrong person about shimming cardboard underneath a low spot in the subfloor. And yes, it might be successful when you're finished the install, you might get paid and get out of there, but it's gonna cause a failure down the road. There's other installers that when they're doing a glue down and there's undulations in the subfloor, they just put extra adhesive in that low spot or sand and we don't, want to put sand on a, on a subfloor. Um, where I'm going with that, you probably don't understand. I've never seen it before. But in Europe and in the olden days, anything that uh, had a low spot on a subfloor, they used to fill with sand and it would just vibrate its way into that low spot and you can install your floor across it. Uh, that's a big no-no. Of course, we don't want to grind, cut, sand, any uh, asbestos. We don't want to overlook any unevenness. It has to be the manufacturer specs. So we can't disregard any of these gaps, holes, moisture issues in the subfloor. So as an installer, as an installation company, please go in and recognize these subfloors as extremely important before you put down any products. Um, following manufacturer's installation instructions. Um, this is a biggie because I don't know too many installers that read instructions once they get out there installing the floor. They put in their floors the same way all the time. And this is where a lot of failures actually happen because when I come in on the job after there's a complaint and I say, but it says this in the instruction and you did something different and it caused this failure. Well, had you read the instructions, you would have been able to do it properly. So I do suggest that you read and follow the inst installation instructions. Um, Read them ahead of time online. Uh, make sure you show up at the right fasteners, the right adhesives, the right installation products. But in the absence of any instructions, and when I say in the absence of instructions or part instructions, because most manufacturers don't cover every single possibility that's happening out there. So in the absence of those, you have to fall back to recognize industry standards. It could be the NFCA, it could be the National Wood Flooring Association or any other association that supports the product that you're putting in that has acceptable instructions. Some manufacturers put out technical bulletins. So what they'll have is they'll have their general instructions for installing engineered floors, for example, but they'll have one particular product that is different and will have a special technical bulletin. We have to check that they're not on the websites or anything special about that product. When in doubt, ask, contact the manufacturer, contact the dealer. Um, we all have smartphones in our pocket. You can pick up and find this information out right away. All installations that we do require adequate perimeter expansion space, uh, proper underlayment and pad. Uh, this is really important because I see a lot of installations that have improper underlayments or they have underlayments when they shouldn't have. Uh, wax paper is one of our most commonly used uh, underlayments in our nail down industry. And it's actually not an accepted product. It's, it's not accepted uh, as an underlayment because it doesn't meet certain requirements. When the installer's installing the floor, they're racking it. Racking means the uh, staggering of end joints and uh, making the floor look beautiful with the different patterns and the different colors that you have. So I summarize this by saying no discernible patterns, no clusters of end joints, no steps, no H's, properly spaced, 
no clusters of dark boards, of light boards. So when you walk into the room, you're looking at this beautiful floor that the manufacturer had intended, had produced their products. And you're not walking into a room that a floor was installed by a homeowner who left all the short, bad, ugly looking boards to the end, and they're all in his last three or four rows. We don't want that. We want to work on a multiple carton. And in our um, engineered world, this is kind of important because you can open up a box and they could be all dark boards. They could be all light boards. But there's nothing wrong with that as long as you scatter them around throughout the job. It is the installer's responsibility to inspect all materials for defects. Now, there, these are, this is considered blatant defects, not hidden defects. So in our tile world, um, I don't see a tile setter putting in a ceramic tile with a chipped corner or a crack in it. So let's not do that in our hardwood world. Let's check for defects and not install those. Use them as cutoffs, use them in uh, inconspicuous areas. Uh, after you're installing the floor, you wanna look the floor over, do a file inspection, any dings and dents, any board replacements that have to come out, any issues any nail holes that have to be filled. It's your final inspection before you hand it back over to the homeowner or cover it for protection because you got other trades still coming into the home. A lot of guys don't do this often enough. It's important to service and adjust your installation tools. If you're not lubricating and cleaning your nailing machines, servicing your compressors, servicing your saws, changing your saw blades, making sure you have all the tools on your truck to do these on the job site. Um, this is really important. It should always be done by the same guy that understands the tools and knows how to operate them. I've even seen when guys are running with dull blades and it's causing the smoke detectors to go off. They haven't adjusted their uh, nailers. Oil is splurting up the walls because it's coming out of the exhaust vent because they're over lubricated. All these cause complaints and they're all avoidable. And then of course, with all installations, we do follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. Basically, there's three types of installations that we commonly do. The first type is a nail or staple down, which is basically a mechanically fastened floor. This is where we blind, blind nail a fastener into the top of the tongue at a prescribed nailing schedule. Now, both these fasteners are available in different lengths and gauges. And this is where I find a lot of installers drop the ball because they'll show up with the wrong fastener, the wrong gauge, the wrong length, because that's all they have on their truck or that's all they're used to installing with. So we have staples, we have cleats. They're both acceptable in the business, but they may not be acceptable on certain products. And this is where I go back to um, read your installation instructions. So there's a relatively new product out on the market, maybe been out for a couple of years now, but it is a three quarter inch staple only product. Most of us have switched over to cleats. Cleats are good on almost anything, except for this newer product that's coming out now is a staple only. So I'm going out on these complaints and I'm going, why are these guys using cleats when it says in the instructions to use staple? Oh, really? They didn't read the instructions. They were there in every box. <clears throat> so we do have to follow the guidelines on spacing as well, because some manufacturers require a different spacing. Put your fasteners four to six inches apart, eight to 10 inches apart. There's a product out there <clears throat> that's because of the construction of the uh, platform that it's made on, these nailing schedules require to be three to four inches apart. But if you don't read the instructions, you're gonna do it your normal way and create a failure or a complaint. <clears throat> a glue down is an installation where we spread adhesive all over the subfloor and then take our floor covering material and uh, embedded into the uh, wet adhesive. The key here is to use an approved adhesive and proper notch trowel. It's so many jobs I see, not so much where the wrong adhesive was used, but more so where the wrong notch trowel was used. And when we're doing a double glue down installation, there's a different notch trowel to glue the underlayment to the subfloor before you glue the flooring to that underlayment. Again, these instructions we're not going to find with the wood manufacturer, but we're going to find with the adhesive manufacturer. Now, going back to that trowel size and profile, we have different trowels and profiles on the market, and they are very, very different. They are a measuring device. So how to prevent a claim is to provide your installer with the adhesive 
and with a set of trowels to use on the job. If you leave the trowel size selection up to the installer, they're going to go off to their truck and say, oh, I don't have that profile. I've only got this one. Well, it's close enough. We'll use it. What is close enough? Can you look at these profiles and see, okay, some are obviously different, but where I want to draw your attention is, do you see the one in the um, top left-hand part of the screen where it says 80 square feet per gallon? That's your coverage. But if we go down to the bottom right um, box, we now have a coverage of 35 square feet per gallon. That is a big difference. That's a big amount of adhesive that should have been used or extra adhesive that was used. And it's funny when I'm looking after these complaints and then the installer says, yeah, I had six pails of adhesive left over. Well, didn't that tell you something? That there was a problem? And that's why the floor is not stuck down. So using the proper trowel size, I think is key on a glue down. What's relatively new in the industry is the glue assist method. What this is, is we do this on a nail down. Now, why do we do these glue assists? Because we're doing wide plank engineering more and more now, that if anybody's been installing for even 20 years, 20 years ago, a wide board was three and a quarter or four inches. We did our two and a quarters, three and a quarters, but now we're in our wide planks. Most of the floors that we're installing today are over five inches wide. You have significantly less fasteners in a wider board when you're nailing it down. So we can put the fasteners a little closer together. That adds a few more fasteners, but we still get a lot of squeaking, noisy complaints out of these wide plank flooring. So we've developed this system of putting glue it can go on the subfloor or the back of the board. And by applying the glue to the back of the board, we're still doing a proper nail down. That's why we call this a glue assist because the nail down is still done by the nail down rules. And we apply the adhesive to the back of the board. Um, a hint that I'm gonna give you right now, a nice takeaway is you see the top profile there, the serpentine pattern. I see a lot of instructions or a lot of installers use the term lazy F. There's no such thing as a lazy S. There is no definition to a lazy S. If an installer puts a little tiny squiggly line down the center of a six, seven inch wide board, you're creating a fulcrum if you put the adhesive down the middle. And then now the tongue and groove on either side are lifted from that center point like a seesaw and it's putting pressure on that tongue and groove profile. It's gonna make the floor more noisy and the installer is going to say, but I, I did a glue assist. It shouldn't do that. It must be a manufacturing related issue. Well, no, but if you do your glue assist, not in the lazy S, but in a serpentine by going edge to edge, we're going to prevent that. The two patterns that I like out of here is the serpentine pattern and the lengthwise parallel strips at the bottom, but they're all acceptable industry standards, providing the manufacturer's instructions say you can use them. It's a great slide, uh, uh, Drew. Just a quick comment that uh, underlined the fact that the nailing pattern um, issued by the manufacturer, if you're nailing this floor down and you're introducing that glue assist, the nailing pattern does not change. You don't suddenly get to put half the nails in the floor. I agree with that. And what I tell people in my training classes is, is one of the installations you have to do properly by the book. So this is a nail down floor with a glue assist. So the nail down has to be done by the proper nail proper fastener, schedule, and the glue is just assisting it. But if I do a glue down and I put in the occasional brad nail, that's a glue down with the occasional nail, the glue down has to be done properly by the book because the nails are just assisting you so your boards don't slide around. So very good point, uh, Chris, and thanks for adding that. A uh, final uh, installation that we commonly do is a floating installation. This is one of the easiest, but believe it or not, there's still, lots of failures that come out of these. A floating installation means the entire floor is not nailed or pinned down anywhere. These floating installations are kind of, you go back to our laminate days because laminate's always been a floating product, but they're fastened together either by gluing at the tongue and groove or mechanically fastened by a licensed click system. And we even have licensed click systems and locking mechanisms on the ends of these joints as well. So expansion has to be around the entire perimeter, not only the entire perimeter, but anything that goes through the floor. 
where I see a lot of these failures is when a pipe goes through the floor and there's no expansion. Closet tracks that are screwed down, you're actually now pinning the floor down with your closet track. A door stopper that's been glued into the floor. Um, we never put a floating floor underneath kitchen cabinets. They're not supposed to go underneath washer and dryers. And here's the funny thing with the washer and dryer. It doesn't cause a floor failure. It voids the warranty on your washer and dryer if it's on a floating floor. But it can't be pinned anywhere. We want a completely floating floor. Uh, what did I say earlier? Something about hygroscopic. Do you remember that slide? So this floor has to expand and contract hygroscopically without any pinch point. This is where we have to recognize our, our spans that we're allowed to go. And some of our products can go a lot of huge spans now, 60 feet, 3,000 square feet before they need a transition. But it has to be able to float. The final part of, um, uh, of the presentation is post-installation maintenance. Now, this isn't just about cleaning. So we do want the homeowner do has to know how to clean their floors, what 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 chemicals, what products to use, what products not to use. This causes a lot of claims in our pre-finished, factory finished flooring market. A lot of people think there's a finish on my floor. It was sold as super durable that I can use water and vinegar. I can put whatever on because it's sealed. No, it's not sealed. So we want to maintain the floor with the proper cleaning material. Never mop your floor with water and vinegar. Don't use steamers. Don't use the furniture polishes, which is your wax cleaners. Oil soaps are a big no-no on our UV cured products, <clears throat> even our oil wax products. Ammonia-based products, never on a hardwood floor. Hardwood floor cleaner or what the manufacturer recommends. And I say that because of our oil wax ones, they have a little bit different type of cleaning and require a rejuvenation process as needed, depending on the wear of the product. And Drew, uh, uh, what a, yeah. a frequency of mopping. I remember one uh, homeowner that I inspected their floor and they told me that they uh, damp mopped the floor three or four times a week and the floor was two years old and the finish was pretty much missing in certain areas. If it's just interesting to do the quick calculation. If it's three times a week, 52 weeks in the year, you've got 150, 160 applications uh, over the floor. It's over two years. Now you've got 300 mopping moments over the floor. It's totally destructive. So homeowners need to know there's a certain amount of uh, frequency that you're expected to uh, clean the floor. There, there is a certain amount of frequency. And... Um... The, the, the mop and water, sometimes on commercial applications, that's done daily because the cleaning staff come in uh, after hours and they, they mop the floors daily and they can be mopping hardwood floors <clears throat> because we do want and have hardwood floors in a lot of commercial applications. But it's funny that you say that about frequency because if you use the right um, cleaning products, like a hardwood floor cleaner, I don't want to mention any brands because there's many brands that we have available to us uh, across Canada, but hardwood laminate cleaners. The interesting part about them is they have a surfactant base. So you can use them actually twice a day and not damage your floors. Let's say you have a, a high traffic, you run a daycare, you have six dogs, uh, all sorts of excuses uh, that you wanna clean your floors daily or, or, or multiple times. These surfactant bases uh, evaporate real quick, almost like Windex does on your windows. When you swipe your, you wash your floor or windows with Windex, you swipe it with a paper towel, it dries instantly. And that's what happens with these proper floor cleaners. They don't build up any um, finish. They don't build up any uh, residue on top of the finishes. They don't have any wax. So when the, if you use a wax cleaner and you get your floor wet, it's going to turn white. They don't dull in or change the manufacturer's gloss level and they can be used all the time. But when you're mopping your floor inappropriately with steamers or water, and let me, uh, you know, coming from a wood science background, if you're putting water on wood that is very dry, so any time in the winter, it's gonna react even more to the wood because you're gonna shock the wood. If you're mopping a floor under a radiant floor he heating system, it's gonna react even more. So that's a good point to check with the manufacturer and check on frequency and what products to use.
What do you say about brushed finishes? Because they're, you know, another oh. introduction. <laughs> brushed finishes. So and uh, right? what, what Chris is talking about is a floor that's a wire brush. So there's, there's a process in the, in the factory where we wire brush it so we can dig out all the spring growth or the coarse grain. So you have that wood look or that genuine wood look. They are fantastic looking floors. They're amazing, but they are very, very difficult to maintain. I've been on dozens, dozens of inspections where debris such as drywall dust has accumulated in the valleys of not only the, uh, the beveled edges, but into the uh, valleys of the brush, but also water pools up there. And what's interesting is when you mop a floor and you get somebody that says, but I use a damp cloth, but then I go right over it immediately with a dry cloth. And in, in my mind, I'm going, well, how did you get the water out of the valleys if you went across with a dry cloth? You've got wet water sitting there. So water comes in, in different forms. It comes in a vapor form, it comes in a solid form. But when you're putting it on in a solid form and it's pooling in these valleys, you, you will damage your floor, not might. You will damage your floor with those wire brushed. We can even say, Chris, not just wire brush floors, but textured floors, hand scrape, uh, anything that has that. And most of the floors out there do have a texture on it right now. Yeah, absolutely. And then you add something like white vinegar or vinegar to your solution and you are in trouble in no time at all. There's no purpose of vinegar on a hardwood floor. Vinegar is not a cleaning solution. All yeah. vinegar does is change the pH of the water. That's all it does. There is yeah. no, I call it an emulsifier. And, you know, the NFCA has uh, cleaning programs and, uh, you know, carpet cleaning. And we need the right emulsifier to clean the, the dirt off. But if you have a water vinegar solution, any oily substances that kitchens produce oil in the, by frying and tracking it in. And you, you'll see that more in restaurants, uh, tracking in and out of the kitchen. But it doesn't clean any of those where you need a solvent-based product to get that oily film off. So water and vinegar is just a rinsing solution that you've changed the pH of the water from neutral to acidic. It does nothing. But yet you go on the internet, you can find out all these secret recipes on how to clean your hardwood floors. I guess as an inspector, it works for me, but manufacturers and distributors, no, just follow the manufacturers on how to maintain your floor. Some are different, but as a general rule, hardwood floor cleaners don't damage or change anything about the hardwood floor. And if manufacturers don't issue good instructions, don't use that manufacturer. I like that one. Um, that is actually a very good point. And if I'm allowed to expand on that, I will. Just don't mention any names. <laughs> no, I won't. But if uh, I, I actually say to manufacturers that say on their boxes, maintain your relative humidity between 45 and 55 percent. Then don't sell your product in Canada. If that is your requirement, do not sell your product in Winnipeg and Calgary and Edmonton, <laughs> Montreal, electric baseboard heat. You're not going to find relative humidity in the 45 and 55 ranges in January, anywhere in Canada, except for Nanaimo and Victoria. <laughs> so yes, if their instructions are wrong, I would say don't sell their product because that manufacturer will be the first to come back and say, oh, they didn't maintain it between 45 and 55. So I even see them on the boxes in the big store. It's written on the side of the box. And I'm like, huh, here it is in a big box store. And it's written right on the side of the box. I'm walking by and going, maintain it 50%. Why would I buy that? I can't maintain my house at 50%. And the same for maintenance details. So uh, my, my, my windows would be sweating profusely at 50% 50, 50 relative humidity in January. So here, here we go. Segue right into environmental conditions. So we have to keep our environmental conditions. This is all part of maintenance because once the installer has done his job correctly and left, it is now up to the homeowner to maintain it properly. So it's imperative for the end user to keep the environmental conditions during the recommended levels. Well, what are the recommended levels? What are the appropriate levels? And I think it's up to the manufacturers to be honest about their product. So let's go back to a, a very, very standard, our, our, our three and a quarter inch solid wood. Well, whether it's red oak or maple, mother nature made that. So why is one manufacturer's three and a quarter inch maple different to somebody another manufacturer's? So 
it should be the same. It should be in the same environments. But here's where I call the manufacturers out on this stuff. And uh, some respect me for it. Some just hang up the phone on me and say, go away. But I say, you say to maintain your relative humidity at 45 to 55%, and that's wrong. But you allow 6% moisture content in the wood. Now, did a light bulb go off in everybody's head there? What was that chart that I had at the very beginning? Because if you allow 6%, you should be allowing 30% relative humidity. So their own instructions is an oxymoron. They have opposites in them. If they say we allow 6%, but you have to maintain it at 50%. Interesting. It's science. Nobody yeah. can change the science. <clears throat> it's good points. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's common to, we all have furnaces in Canada. I don't know too many people that don't have a furnace and live in Canada, probably a couple of them. But what we, what we lack a little bit are humidifiers and dehumidifiers. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about HRVs because we have these nice air conditioners that come on uh, when they work and these furnaces that come on, that temperature, what are we doing about the relative humidity in the air? Only the certain houses that have humidifiers and dehumidifiers. Um, now, here's an interesting statistic that I heard, and I kind of believe it, but um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong here. But I was told that only 20% of Canadians have air conditioning. And I said, what? Everybody I know has air conditioning. Well, I live in Southern Ontario, the Toronto area. But anybody north in Northern Ontario, they don't have air conditioning. I mean, how popular is air conditioning in Vancouver? Not everybody has it. Do you even need air conditioning on the island? Do you need air conditioning in Edmonton? And We've got the Pacific North Ocean here. No. So that's where, and we talk rental apartments. How many rental apartments don't have air conditioning? So an East Coast would be included into this about if it's moderate, we don't need it. But again, where I live, everybody I know has air conditioning. But can we install hardwood in a place without air conditioning? Yes, we can. And it would work. But we still have to maintain certain parameters. HRVs. They're more and more popular now. They're going into almost every new home being built because our homes are tighter and tighter, uh, less air leaks. So it's kind of beneficial if you're in an older house and you have air leaks because you're getting automatic fresh air into your house. But I have so many people tell me, oh, I don't need a humidifier. I have an HRV. That maintains my humidity. Here's my, re here's my reaction to them or my reply. There is no water line to your uh, HRV. There's no water supply line. So how can it maintain humidity? It has a drain line. That's condensation. That's a dew point. That's when um, warm, humid air hits something cold and it's going to cause condensation. It drains it out, but there's nothing to introduce moisture. So an HRV does not control humidity. It just takes out condensation. <clears throat> a lot of people misunderstand that. So sometimes the uh, consumer uh, end user has to be educated or reminded uh, how to maintain their condition. And a simple hygrometer, I mean, these things are 10, 15 bucks. I don't know why more people don't have them or companies are not giving them out. Uh, so homeowners can be, uh, control their humidity and recognize it a little bit easier. So the last thing I got on this slide here is a greenhouse effect. Now this is primarily for new builds or builders out there or people that like to vacation. So what is greenhouse effect? Greenhouse effect is when you close up your home, you have high humidity and low airflow. Perfect for tomatoes. But what is that doing to my hardwood floor? If I build a brand new house, I close it in June, and I go away for three months and I leave it closed. I'm not paying for the air conditioner to be on when I'm not there. What's happening to my hardwood floors? Getting toast, getting ruined. So. Greenhouse effect is something that we have to avoid and the builders have to avoid. Um, if there's any time that a, a house is sitting vacant, it still needs to maintain normal living conditions, particularly with humidity. And I say that because temperature doesn't affect wood. Uh, University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, where I go down there all the time to play in their labs, you need about 300 degrees to affect wood. But what the moisture content is in the wood what affects the wood. 
that change. So abuse protection. We have to protect our floors from abuse. It's, it's so, so critical in this industry. All hardwood floors scratch and dent. So don't oversell your products. When you've got a product in there and the manufacturer's coming in advertising some diamond plate finish, titanium, ceramic, it's bulletproof, it's designed by NASA, like all hardwood floors scratch and dent. It might be superior finish, but that's like saying, so the hood of my car will never get a stone chip when I'm driving down the highway? No, the paint today is harder, it's better, but I can't say it won't happen. So I do get complaints by saying, well, my hardwood floor scratch, you know, um, I got three German shepherds and they're scratching the floor. I'm like, well, well, of course they will. All hardwood floor scratch and dent. So we can't oversell the products and we have to understand their limitations. Keeping high heels and shoes in good repair, pet nails trimmed, pads on furniture, especially chairs that move back and forth. And I see this all the time on our hand scrape product where the, the peaks of the undulations are all wearing off, but the valleys are fine, right? Where the chairs are at the uh, kitchen counter or the, the kitchen table. Uh, area rugs and walk-off mats. Area rugs clean your feet or they act as a pivot point, especially if you have dogs, because um, <clears throat> I'm a dog person and a dog's claws are always retracted, but they come out automatically when they're on a hard surface. But when they're on grass or carpet or something where they don't need to purchase into the ground, their claws are retracted. But when they get to the pavement, that's why you hear the clicking of their claws on the sidewalk and on the hardwood floors, because they're trying to purchase into it. And what are they doing? They're just scratching the finish. So if you have a, an area rug that's a pivot point, which is like a, an intersection at the base of the stairs or somewhere where you would turn 90 degrees, the dog would head for that area rug, then turn and then go again. And it would actually reduce a lot of scratches in your floors. Window coverings. Uh, a lot of our floors today, uh, complaints are about the floors changing color. Window coverings prevent that. And of course, keeping your floors clean, keep all the dirt and debris off your floors. Uh, so it doesn't get ground into the finish because no finish is impervious and all hardwood floors scratch and dent. And that brings us to the end. If I can put this screen back over to you. Very good. 